Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land of the Lord that your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife, or his manservant, or maidservant, his ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour.
So he made out the whip out of the cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and are you going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth, meditation in all our hearts, be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please sit down. During this time of COVID, I wonder what, if anything, has made you righteously angry. I don't mean just generally angry at the perceived or even actual stupidity, failings, or misdirection of the government or their advisors or angry at your lack of freedoms because you have to wear a mask to observe social distancing and can't do the things you most enjoy. No, I mean righteously angry. Righteously angry at the terrible injustices in society worldwide that this pandemic has exposed. Injustices such as the plight of hungry, even starving children the terrible enforced isolation of people in care homes or prisons. And how many of you felt, as I did, righteously angry only this week at the government's derisory and, in my opinion, insulting offer of a 1% wage increase to our heroes in the NHS? Is it any wonder they are up in arms, feeling that all they have sacrificed over the last year is counted for virtually nothing. In our gospel reading today, we read of Christ's righteous anger as he entered the temple precincts and found there not a place of sanctity, but a place where man had reserved, reserved the divine. A place where the poor were being ripped off as they were forced to exchange harder Roman coins specially minted temple coins, a place where the birds and animals represented for sacrifice had a premium on their heads, no matter how small or scraggy, a place where the religious hierarchy were happily accumulating their own wealth as the poor was stripped of theirs. No wonder Jesus was angry. This was all so unjust so counter to the spirit in which the temple had been built. The spirit that wanted this great edifice to be a place of sanctuary, a place of prayer, a place of praise, a place where the glory and presence of God could be demonstrated through those prayers and that praise. Instead, it was an edifice where earthly powers now sought their own glory, their own well-being, as their prayers for worldly worth usurp those for heavenly worth. 
when we step inside any holy building, I'm sure it is the silence that so often prevails that helps remind us of the sanctity of the place and in that liminal silence find the presence of God. But in the temple precincts, all Jesus heard was the frenetic sound of commerce and the noises and cries of terrified animals and birds. No wonder his eye was aroused. No wonder he burst forth in condemnation of such practices. The house of God had indeed become a marketplace, and not just any marketplace, but a corrupt, confusing, and unjust marketplace. We very often attribute love as the characteristic that was most recognizable in Jesus. And yes, love for God's children always there at the heart of all that he did. But in loving, he also was passionate about justice and the plight of those who suffered from the injustices imposed upon them by the self-interest and selfishness of those who held more power, more influence and more clout than they would ever hope for. A version of the Lord's Prayer I frequently use has in place of the phrase, Your Kingdom Come, the words, May we work with you to establish your new order of justice, peace and love. And I think the order is critical, because without justice there cannot be peace. And without justice and peace there cannot be the perfection of Christ's love. And surely in the light of today's Gospel reading, the place to begin with is our institutional church and our individual churches. I'm making quite sure that they are truly places of justice and peace, where God can be found and where you be happy to be found in whatever pew he chose to sit in. Surely being church is not about an overwhelming and self-important, self-regarding hierarchy imposing their will, their ideas, their demands even on others, and with a protective attitude to self-interest akin to that demonstrated by the Pharisees. Being church is surely about fostering a genuine, and pervasive sense of communion, a sense of companionship and mutual respect, a sense of community as we strive to live the gospel and both worship and serve the Lord God, a place where in God's eyes all are equal. It is all too easy for both the church as a body and individual churches to become obsessed with what one might term the marketplace, where the finances and fundraising, together with all those maintenance jobs of upkeep, future planning, documentation and administration take precedence. But for the true purpose of any church to be realised, we should surely heed the words of Jean Vanier. The church is a place of compassion and fecundity, a place of welcome and friendship. I think we need to begin by ensuring that our churches provide a place of warm and sustained work and empathetic care for all, and I do stress all, who come to join as part of the body of Christ in worship. I think one criticism, which very sadly I think is true of almost all churches that I have attended, is that though they profess to be friendly, too often there are very obvious cliques, and simply not enough open-handed friendship is extended to all who come, not just on Sundays, but at other times, for to be part of a church is decidedly not just about what we do on a single day of the week. 
And in saying this, I think we need to be mindful of past and current history, when the church as a whole has been and is still today guilty of stigmatizing, marginalizing, ostracizing, or even excluding specific groups of people. Christ was angry in part because those who came to the temple were in effect being treated as consumers to be exploited rather than as pilgrims on the journey of grace. Do we in our churches sometimes do the same? Do the dioceses do the same as they look at attendance figures and balance sheets and make corporate plans for the future of small churches such as this one? Are our, our, our eyes and theirs open to the reality that we are all fellow pilgrims sharing a mutual need above all else for God's blessing on that journey? The numbers and the balance sheet are surely irrelevant. What is relevant is the journey together as one body, be it in twos and threes or in hundreds. Jesus was undoubtedly right to show such righteous anger. And we too are called as his followers to show righteous anger and to speak out and act against injustice and penalising discrimination wherever we find it. And it strikes me that Lent is the ideal time to take stock and to make absolutely sure that our churches are places where Christ, in whatever guise he comes, would find our churches are truly places where any marketplace values take a very secondary role and all can expect a generous, all-embracing, loving welcome with absolutely no strings attached. And in that spirit of the welcome, he would be more than happy to stand beside us in a spirit of justice and peace, as together we offer up heartfelt prayer and soaring praise to the glory of God the Father. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Please be seated. This is a paraphrase of the opening lines of Psalm 88. O Lord, the God who saves us, day and night we cry out for you. May our prayer come before you, turn your ear to our cry. We pray for the world. Dear Lord, we are very fortunate to live in an area of the world which is safe and politically stable. We think of areas, countries where this is not the case, such as Yemen, Libya, Syria. In particular this morning, we think of Myanmar, once called Burma, where the military junta seized power on the 1st of February this year put the leader of the opposition, Aung San Suu Kyi, into prison on trumped-up charges. The regime is brutal and has killed unarmed, peaceful protesters. Lord, we would simply ask that countries outside Myanmar can put pressure on the junta through organisations such as the United Nations so that the perpetrators of these dreadful crimes can be brought to justice and democracy can be restored. Heavenly Father, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. We pray for the politicians of this country who are responsible for our route out of lockdown. Thank you for the success of the vaccination programme in which we now have over 40% of the adult population vaccinated with the first jab. We think of all those who are refusing the invitation to be vaccinated, whether because of superstition or false information. We ask that you would support and encourage those who are trying to persuade them to accept the jab as a way of reducing the risk to other people's lives. Heavenly Father, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Thank you for the step change in the time taken to bring new drugs to the marketplace that has reduced the elapsed time of development from five years to one year and will accelerate further modifications to cope with new variants as they emerge. We pray for the scientists who are working flat out to analyse the path of the pandemic, as well as assess the impact of the drugs that are being invented and 
child. Heavenly Father, in your mercy. We lift, up the, lift those to you who have the responsibility for deciding the pay increase for NHS workers. Give them good judgment in rewarding the NHS staff for their selfless efforts in managing, testing and caring for millions of us, whether in hospital or in doctor surgeries. Help them find the right compromise between the desire to say thank you and the financial constraints of the COVID outbreak on the economy. Heavenly Father, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray for the leadership of this church. Father, we pray for Tony and Hilary as they seek to guide us. Give them wisdom and vision in their leadership and the energy with which to deliver it. We also pray for the PCC and thank you for all those who give their time and talent so generously towards the planning, upkeep and presentation of our church. Encourage them in their concern and diligence at this challenging time. Heavenly Father, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our community. Father, we thank you for the strength and diversity of our local community. We pray for all those who are sick at this time. We thank you for the improvement in Jim Reed that would raise Michael Moore to you. We also pray for those who, as a consequence of the enforced isolation, are not able to see their friends and family. Those who find the loneliness that creates, that creates mental pressure and anxiety. As restrictions are eased, we think of the children going back to school. Keep them safe and help them to enjoy the new experience. Inspire us to look out for our neighbours be generous with our time, to think about those whom we come into contact with and take action where it is required. Heavenly Father, in your mercy. Amen. Lastly, in John 2 this morning, we heard how Jesus was incensed by the misuse of the temple courts. Aid us in ensuring that we use and develop St. James for all the right reasons. Help us to make our church an attractive and relevant space for all those who live in our church. Lord, keep us focused on your agenda rather than ours. Give us enthusiasm to spread, spread your word and remind us that we all have a part to play in your plan and deter us from thinking that we may lack the skills to contribute. Show us the way, Lord. Heavenly Father, in your mercy. Here we are. We ask all these prayers in your Son Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we gather at the Lord's table, we must recall the promises and warnings given to us in the Scriptures. Let us therefore examine ourselves and repent of our sins. Let us give thanks to God for his redemption of the world through his Son, Jesus Christ. And as we remember Christ's death for us and receive this pledge of his love, let us resolve to serve him in holiness and righteousness 
or the days of our God. You then, who truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors, and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from this day forward in his holy ways, draw near with faith. And take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge and lament our many sins and the wickedness we have committed time after time by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty. We have provoked your righteous anger and your indignation against us. We earnestly repent and are deeply sorry for these our wrongdoings. The memory of them weighs us down. The burden of them is too great for us to bear. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, will give us all his parts. Grant that from this time forward we may always serve and please you in newness of life to the honour and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy on you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goods, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the words of comfort our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So you have loved the world. That he gave us an only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Hear what St. Paul says. This saying is true and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear what St. John says. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Therefore, lift up your hearts. <laughs> Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks to Christ. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Heavenly Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God. And now we give you thanks because you give us the spirit of discipline that we may triumph over evil and grow in grace as we prepare to celebrate the Paschal Mystery with heart and mind renewed. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of them, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Trusting in our own righteousness, 
but in your manifold and great masses. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made by his body, and our souls walk through his most precious blood, and that we may have a word with him, and he in us. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who may dare by his one oblation of himself once offer a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray. And grant that we receive in these thy gifts of cre creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's own institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. With the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it. And gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of them. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shared for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life, we who drink his cup bring life to others, we whom the Spirit loves give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love, now and always. Amen. Amen.